This hour, we're having a conversation about boosting intra-Africa trade. And two guests uh, will join us. One of them is already here. Frederick Alo is the National Secretary of the Kenya International Freight and Warehousing Association. Good morning, Frederick. Good morning, Du. Karibu sana. Asante. All right. Uh, getting into that conversation this morning, but we don't do that because we're the tradition here. And we want to get you thinking a little bit this morning and giving your opinions. A city gives us the proverb from DRC. Yeah. Yes, uh, our proverbs for the whole of this week come from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. Okay. In every village, there is a white chicken. Now, I can say this with certainty that when we had the last census they didn't count the chicken <laughs> no <laughs> well mark did and so uh, mark may have <laughs> we are then going to ask where mark comes from because well, that's where people have senses of chicken yeah. well i i i am a certified lawyer so by birth i am a professor of chicken <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> Well, uh, Frederick. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, like uh, Mark has said, he's a certified lawyer. Mm. I'm also a certified lawyer. So we are not that far away from the chicken. <laughs> In that case, yes. what yeah, do you yeah. make? Yeah, I'm a shame. You don't get to a person. Yeah, exactly. It's a derby. It's a chicken derby. The chicken derby. At this point. Yes. What do you make of this proverb? Every village has a white chicken. Uh, every village has a white chicken. Uh, I think uh, from the literal uh, meaning of this uh, proverb, uh, I think, uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, from the African traditional setting, chicken is part and parcel of our village. And uh, uh, from the way I can see it is that uh, uh, maybe what uh, the saying tries to, uh, to portend is that uh, uh, we have... Uh, people with the different uh, unique uh, uh, qualities amongst us. Mm. Yeah, you might uh, maybe from the African traditional set you might get a family of ten uh, but maybe one has very unique uh, setting. I think that's uh, from the literal uh, general understanding about it. Mm. Yeah. He's looking at UCT. I, I know he's looking at me and how right he is. Give me you know the, <laughs> the traditional setting and he is right. Huh? Yeah. A homestead was incomplete if it didn't have chicken or cows. Mm. Yes. True. You could throw in the odd sheep. Goats were not very common. It's true. Sheep, chicken, cows. The, that's when you felt the the, 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 the homestead was complete. Mm. And there were the cockerels who make noise very early in the morning. And uh, yes, yep. because a lot of the activities in the rural setting yeah. had to do with tending to these. Mm. It's very early in the morning. People woke up to go to the farm to milk, to all these things. So, yeah. yes. Uh, interestingly enough, there is a modern push, speaking of chicken, um, I forget the country, where they gave um, a certain uh, village, a cul-de-sac, if you will, mm. uh, three chickens per household for free. Mm. And they reduced the waste, organic waste going to landfills by a whopping 98%. Mm. So it might not just be a traditional solution, it could be a modern one It could one be well. a modern one as well. Yeah. How do you tie the three chickens with the land waste? <laughs> so basically, if you have chicken scraps, that's what you feed your chicken. So the idea was not you go buy a chick meal and chicken meal. Yeah, if you have scraps so in your house. So your chicken scraps are what you feed your chicken. Okay. Well, with these two gentlemen, we could talk about chicken the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> Not likely, yes. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> we, how about we talk about trade on another level when we look now at intra-Africa trade and the conversations that have been going on um, here in East Africa around the continent for years in terms of what we need to do to boost trade amongst ourselves as nations, uh, the barriers that need to be lifted and all of these conversations happening. The most recent with G to G, especially when it comes to fuel, and we'll get into that um, this morning. But let's start off, Frederick. First of all, the National Secretary of the Kenya International Freight and Warehousing Association. What do you do? Uh, thank you very much, Ndu. Uh, Kenya International Freight and Warehousing Association uh, is a body of all the customs clearing agents uh, in the country. Mm. Uh, you realize that uh, uh, maybe if, uh, let me uh, from the, a little background, you realize that uh, the Kenya Revenue, uh, Revenue Authority uh, has two departments. Mm. We have the Customs and Border Control Department 
and the domestic tax department. So our members, uh, we, are uh, we are domiciled at the Department of Customs and Border Control. So what we do uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the laymen outside there, you, we are referred to as clearing and forwarding agents. Mm. So what we do is uh, we facilitate the logistical uh, processes uh, for all goods that come uh, into the country and those that leave mm. all the imports and the exports yeah so that is where we are domiciled kenya the national freight and warehousing association we have 1200 members mm. who are licensed by the commission of customs and border control mm. to do this uh, cross-border uh, processes mm -hmm. yeah so you're not a proving product because we know that there are bodies that do that i mean there is the uh bureau of standards yeah. there those there are very many what you're doing is essentially as they come in you're sending them off to the next destination or as they come in you're sending them out so bringing them into kenya sending them to the destination or as they come to the port sending them outside of kenya to their next destination isn't it yes yeah what we be, uh, what we basically do is that we act as a, a link between the trader and uh, the government agencies you realize that uh, in kenya we have uh, like 32 government agencies that are involved in uh, uh, the cargo clearance processes uh, so for example if you were to import a car you look for a clearing agent and uh, number one will help you with uh, the logistical process uh, let's say you want to import a car from south africa or maybe sbt japan uh, our role uh, entails uh, looking for the clients uh, maybe co uh, connecting you with uh, the trader uh, in south africa in japan we do we'll book this consignment either by air or by uh, by sea we look for you the best uh, airline or shipping line have your goods brought here when they reach the port or the airports uh we do the customs processes uh, uh you realize that uh, one of the things that we do uh, is uh, help the government uh, in the uh, collection of uh, duties mm -hmm. and uh, another thing that these 32 government agencies do uh, may be on the regulations so you are the link uh, between the government uh, and the traders so we are we are in the middle there mm. yes so are you middlemen <laughs> mm, yeah let me say middlemen mm. uh, yes we are middlemen per se because you realize that uh, for example, uh, the person who is in charge uh, with the correct declarations, it's us. So if you get maybe, if a clearing agent does uh, uh, does not get the acts right, you realize uh, the pain can also uh, can translate to you mm. and you bear uh, the consequences. And if they're efficient, advantages to you. So time is of great uh, essence to us and uh, doing uh, all the compliances that are needed mm. by the respective uh, uh, legislations. Okay. Yeah. So what are some of the things, if we're looking at government to government, then that you'd be associated in directly to say that the government of Kenya in its dealings with the government of, I don't know, randomly here, Uganda, is working with that you would then be able to come in and or do you play in those fields where government to government are working on when they're there, when they're bringing in you know goods or whether they're delivering or taking out certain things do you come in here yeah so what happens uh, you realize uh, I'll, give, I'll give you an example with the esc uh we uh kenya is a signatory to the esc uh, uh treaty mm -hmm. and you realize that uh, through the esc treaty we have the east african common market protocols and one of the things that uh, this protocol does is uh, the free movement of goods and uh, persons uh, so you realize that uh, once uh, there's some treaties bilateral treaties that uh, the government of kenya does with, let's say the government of uganda uh, maybe they remove some uh, barriers uh, uh, some uh, they come up with some tariffs mm -hmm. so once they, they've come up with the, the role of a clearing agent in this uh, all transaction is uh, as we we are now the implementers of what this government has done for example if uh, let's say the governments uh, from uh, uh, if, uh, from the ESC currently mm -hmm. you realize that the goods that come within the ESC region f uh, following the government agreements uh, we uh, within the ESC there's no duty uh, there's no duty Mm. So it's upon me as a clearing agent or upon our members now to process the rules. Uh, we, we call them uh, uh, the certificates of origins mm. uh, f within the ESC, uh, process uh, these zero duty uh, entries 
and ensure that they trade that benefits from all these transactions. How easy is it for, for countries who are doing business with Kenya to then have their goods cleared to come into the country or even for Kenya, who's doing business with other countries to have goods taken out. Let's look at the ease with which this actually happens. Because if we're talking about boosting intra-Africa trade, one of the challenges that has been looked at over the years is really how easy it is. East Africa Treaty talks about enhancing or boosting a situation whereby it is easy for the countries of the community to do trade with each other. What are the things that you've seen pop up that may not make it so easy to do that which the charter or the treaty prescribes? I think within the EAC treaty, we have done uh, tremendously well uh, in terms of trade uh, within the EAC. Uh, in terms of the tariffs, uh, we have tariffs that favor uh, each other. For example, if we have a product that is in, uh, manufactured only uh, within the EAC region, uh, currently as the treaty is uh, uh, within the EAC, we enjoy these... Uh, uh, zero duties uh, as opposed to if you were to bring some goods maybe out of the ESC. Mm. Uh, so within the ESC, I think we've uh, done tremendously well. So on uh, intra-Africa trade, there's a very big challenge that we are having uh, because uh, you realize that uh, Africa is segmented into eight different uh, regional blocks mm. or the trade blocks. Uh, for example, we have the ESC in the East Africa, we have uh, SADAC, uh, we have uh, IGAD, uh, we have uh, ECOWAS, uh, among others. So you realize that there's some uh, uh, preferential treatment that uh, an ECOWAS member uh, enjoys, which an ESC member cannot enjoy. If you look at the statistics currently the way it is, uh, intra-Africa trade, uh, we are doing below 15% uh, trade within Africa. Mm. Uh, if you look at uh, maybe globally, uh, for example, the level of trade that Kenya does, with the, maybe the West African countries, you cannot compare it with what the, uh, the level of business that we do with the China, for example, or even Europe. Why? Uh, I think uh, we've had uh, quite a number of bottlenecks mm -hmm. that have uh, jeopardized, that have acted as an, as a, an impediment to intra-African trade. And uh, that's why maybe uh, we thank uh, maybe the heads of states, uh, they found it wise maybe to come up with the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, mm. uh, which now uh, seeks uh, to uh, boost intra-Africa trade among us. As. Yeah. You know, in, in fact, that's where I wanted to jump in because um, I, I was working for the Kenya Export uh, yeah. and Branding Agency for quite a while. Yeah. And the biggest question we had, and, and Uganda is one of our most important traders much, I think. Yeah. It's a number one in terms of what we export yeah. as a country. But it's been quite difficult uh, to expand that beyond East Africa. In fact, the trade between Kenya and Ethiopia, for example, is quite minimal. Yeah. Uh, we can say the same of Somalia. I think we only trade in our ship and goods between the border there and, mm. and, and Chaco. So the Africa Free Trade Agreement was stuck in South Africa because the South, South African Customs Union had an issue with it and, and, and they were taking time. West Africa has basically been locked up by the French for a long time. Mm. But because of the current coups and anti-French sentiment, that is a big market opportunity. How are you as players in the field hoping to expand Kenya's export uh, capacity beyond the boundaries of east africa taking advantage of the free trade agreement for example uh, ghana has already agreed to do so and we have visa free access to ghana as well mm -hmm. yeah maybe to answer you uh first of all maybe if i come to uh to the question in relation to ghana i uh, will realize that uh, the first uh, consignment i think it was last year whereby we launched the first uh, consignment of tea from the port of mombasa mm -hmm. all the way to accra ghana uh, this one was done uh, courtesy of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, another issue that, uh, 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 that that we realize, we realize that uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we had, I think, uh, Africa, despite us calling ourselves uh, uh, people from the same continent, uh, we have not uh, had that easy uh, uh, trade among us because we have these unnecessary fears. Uh, you realize, I'll give you an example, maybe before 2021, if somebody was to go all the way to a free, uh, free town in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. uh, even on flights alone, you could go, uh, you could take a flight to Nairobi all the way to Dubai. Then from Dubai, you make a connecting flight from, du uh, from Dubai to uh, Freetown. 
Uh, this is one of the things that we are having, the, one of the problems. If you look at even the air traffic, uh, Africa, uh, we have very minimal air traffic because even uh, on traffic, uh, uh, flights within uh, Africa, into Africa is a problem. Uh, another issue that we have, uh, uh, we, we have uh, realized uh, with this is that uh, uh, apart from that, there's something that, we, uh, that is currently being done. Uh, the head of states, uh, you talked about the countries uh, not signing, for example, the South Africa. Uh, currently, we have around 54, country, 54 countries that have signed to the Africa Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is uh, maybe city, uh, city will, 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 I can tell you, uh, I'll give an example of somebody who is used to serial smoking. You know you cannot uh, remove them from smoking quite a lot though i don't do i don't smoke personally mm. so it's something that you do it gradually so i think this is one of the challenges that we are having maybe we fear that if we open our markets in terms of job opportunities some of us we are going to lose are we saying so, I, uh, sorry <laughs> are we saying <laughs> it, it, it the intrigues of trade and the benefit that it can provide to a country is not mysterious to anybody it is very clear mm. the uh the the benefits that come from it that is obvious yeah but somehow it's easy okay. to trade mm. with a country that is thousands of kilometers away mm. China, for example, um, and this is the same for very many African countries. Mm. But to do that thing which would seem as though it was a no-brainer within the continent, for people that to a certain extent or level that you would say we can understand, it seems so difficult. What is the real reason, for example, why flights from one African country to another, that issue till date has never been addressed? It's been discussed. We talk about it at conferences. We do top layer conversations, mm. but it never actually goes to the nitty gritty. If you were in Europe today, for example, mm. if you are in Paris mm. and you were flying to Oslo mm. or you were flying to um, to Rotterdam, mm. you would spend 150 euros, 100 euros, for example, to and fro where you were going. Two hours, you do your business, you come back. Why are we not able, and this is, intra-country trade intra-country travel why are we not able to seriously have the conversation about reducing the cost of travel within africa it doesn't make sense that i go from nairobi to abuja and spend one thousand four hundred one thousand three hundred dollars doesn't make sense that you fly from nairobi to johannesburg and you spend the same number you spend the same amount that you go from nairobi to dar es salaam and you're spending five hundred dollars it doesn't make sense mm, yeah. those should be one of the vital conversations that is happening today if we want to really talk about trading within a continent yeah. fun fact do mm. the presidents of um the french west africa in 1964 65 i believe mm. had a conference to discuss why it was cheaper to call paris france from cameroon than it was to call Niger from Cameroon. Mm. This issue has been on the table for a long mm. time. Mm. And Africa especially has fear and phobia of ourselves. Of ourselves. Mm. For example, mm. one of the most feared nations in West Africa mm. is Nigeria. Mm. Okay? One of the most feared nations in East Africa it's is Kenya. Kenya. Mm. One of the most fearful nations is south africa mm. those three form the key access mm. of open market and democracy by the way in those regions their leaders in thought their leaders in economy and their leaders in influence if those three are locked then most of africa is locked with it and it's not just locked because of tariff barriers in terms of mm. how much it costs to get things it is mm. also locked in terms of the culture and the phobia let's look at magufuli mm. how many kenyans did he chase out of tanzania because he was afraid of Kenyans. So there is that is, the only reason, Mark? Mm. Well, there are not lots of reasons, of course. Um, we can enumerate them. But the point is mm. that the cultural psyche of Africa needs to change, not just the laws on our books. Mm. Is it the psyche, really? I mean, um, I like what you're saying, and it points to something that is actually true. But uh, ask yourself a simple question. Huh? Mm. 
is integrated is, is integration brought about mm. by f or the lack of it by phobia or is it by ignorance phobia at the mm. governmental level ignorance at the hoi poloi level yes mm. i would argue that it is ignorance that spurs the phobia mm. Mm. because it is very difficult if you look at what south africa has been associated with in the not too distant past mm. xenophobia yep. mm. okay how do you think that comes about but don't we mm. fear what we don't know that's just the thing it's very uh, rare that you find somebody yes. afraid of the thing that they know yes mm. it's that they're aware but, of so yes. south africa is, is is it's a bit personal to me because i lived there and i experienced quite a bit of xenophobia the, the South African xenophobia is different. It's different from what, for example, Kenyans would experience in Tanzania or what Tanzanians would experience. How different it it is. is different because when the ANC came into power, they came into power, the enemy was the white man. It was the poor. After 10, 20 years, around the year 2002, when Mbeki was leaving office, they needed to make another enemy. And they began to tell people that the reason why you've not felt the benefits of the ANC is because of this Zimbabwean, that those were the first culprits, mm. who have come and they're cleaning your streets and they're opening little shops by the side. Slowly by slowly, Nigerians came in because the bulk of the population was lazy. Today, what what is the biggest issue if you watch the documentary okay. by the bbc uh, lazy, a week ago la lazy mark mark go gently on that one <laughs> go gently on that no, one I'm, I'm, I'm stating what is reported yes i have yes. also worked in south africa for a long time yes so not lazy yeah. let's look at history and give the benefits what sort of education did the black person in south africa have right so that when opportunities presented themselves <laughs> they were they even do. prepared to take over not. these opportunities this is all very interesting because you know what it does is that it actually does then yeah. lay the foundation for the establishing of some of these habits that we are seeing today when it comes directly to trade it's layered and we can't run away from that because yes there's a charter that has been signed there's a treaty that has been signed there's an mm. agreement at governmental level heads of state have come together time without number and said let's open up our borders let's allow people to come and roam free let's allow trade to actually escalate mm. and all of these underlying issues then contribute to what we are seeing today in terms of doing business throughout the continent so the question is how then can we make it easier what should heads of government be looking at what should communities be agreeing on to make it happen but you don't do mm. in east africa that statement isn't actually true is it not no mm. because if you look at how we've progressed over time it's like we achieve something destroy it retrace our steps and start all over again this east african countries kenya uganda and tanzania had a common currency meaning the ugandan kenyan tanzania shilling was exchangeable at the same rate at some point yes, yes. it was it was we had east african railways and harbors meaning we had corporations which were integrated mm -hmm. and the headquarter was in mombasa mm -hmm. we had postal and telecommunications headquarters mm -hmm. was in uganda east african education, Air, education. yes dar es salaam mm -hmm. i'm trying to say we these things we are talking about and grappling with we had them mm -hmm and they were working these borderless discussions they existed you could many kenyans went to school in uganda yes. many kenyans went to school in tanzania and vice versa and it was considered normal yes mm. so now mm. somewhere we lost it that whole thing was dismantled and now we are starting all over again and, and, and funny and, enough and how funny enough mm. we are benchmarking with the european union mm. who which copied us us <laughs> We had gotten this thing worked out yes. long before the Europeans. Yes. Long, long, long. And you know the how Europeans. long we took to shut out up the East African community yeah. as it was? One day. So what are we doing <laughs> we now? And it I think in one day. <laughs> so Frederick, yes. in terms of what actually is happening, mm. give us. I mean, we paint a picture of what should be happening, but what actually is happening, and how can we see that steps have been made in that direction? I think I agree with the city and Mark uh, when they make their these uh, sentiments of where we've come from. I'm a firm believer that uh, experience at times come from bad decisions, and it is through experience that we make good decisions. 
Uh, so what is uh, what is uh, what's happening? Uh, for example, we believe uh, these uh, for these business who are to thrive uh, for us to succeed. Uh, these uh, uh, something which needs both the government and the private sector uh, to join hands. So from the private sector point of view, uh, there's something there's a conversation we are having uh, amongst us and amongst uh, all the stakeholders. Uh, for example, coming uh, next week on the 22nd to 24th, we have a convention. We call it the Global Logistics Convention that uh, we've organized uh, in conjunction with the Federation of East African Freight Forwarders Association, which will be it will be the fourth convention within the ESC uh, that we bring in now all the logistics uh, sector players uh, within the globe. And uh, one thing that we seek to address is some of these challenges. We need to have a discussion. Uh, we need to come and uh, network. Uh, we need to come and uh, uh, share the innovations that we are having. Uh, we need to come and uh, meet with these policy makers and uh, have some of these discussions of what is happening. Because we believe uh, uh, at times uh, when these things happen, I realize that uh, the, the policy makers, they don't have uh, the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom on what is happening. That's why we need to have a uh, constant uh, uh, conversation with them. Because uh, to me, it does not make sense. Uh, for example, if I was, uh, if if uh, we had, to, if we were to have an export uh, from Kenya uh, to West Africa, uh, the freight rates that we'll pay is almost three times more mm -hmm. than what we would pay maybe from China. So these are some of the discussions that we are having, and we'll be meeting with the government and all uh, 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 the practitioners, the stakeholders on the twenty second to twenty fourth at Safari Park uh, Hotel. So the world will come to Africa. Mm. And uh, in regards to the actualization of uh, the Africa continental free trade area, if you look at uh, maybe the model and uh, on what is happening on the ground, I think we've made quite a number of strides because uh, the implementation was to be, uh, was to Give be happening. Give us examples of these strides. Mm. Uh, number one, we are doing away with, uh, you, you'll see maybe recently, like for example in Kenya, the president uh, is now giving almost, uh, uh, is doing away with visa, requirements for all African countries. If you look at this week, I think uh, in Rwanda, the president of Rwanda, uh, His Excellency uh, President Kagame, uh, he gave some release that uh, Rwanda is also going to give free visas to all Africans. Mm. And uh, quite a number of countries are doing that. This is one of the things that we are doing. Another thing that uh, on from the logistics sector point of view, uh, some of the discussions that uh, will take center stage in our convention which is coming is uh, for us to achieve 100% uh, uh, implementation of this uh, uh, SCFTA, uh, we need to do the infrastructure. If you look at Kenya, for example, uh, if you look at our air infrastructure, the government, we are doing quite a commendable work. Uh, for example, at JKI, if you go to JKI, uh, we've enhanced uh, the cargo capacity. Currently, JKI can handle 1.2 million uh, tons of cargo annually. Uh, uh, you realize that because we don't do intra-Africa trade, uh, we still cannot achieve that. We are doing around uh, uh, 400,000 uh, 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 capacity. And when you say cannot handle, it's because of the restrictions in terms of cost. If there were to be business, would it happen? So that I think that there's a double layer here. That is there business that then is being put at bay because the cost of freight, for example, are too high. And even though you do have a free trade area, there still has not been agreement in practice by governments to make sure that if you're moving something, for example, from Nairobi or from Mombasa to Lagos, that on the other side, Lagos has not said, well, you know what, we're not going to give you this price. Is that the reason that there's business, but that we won't we'll have an agreement on the prices, or that there's no business at all? At all? I think if you ask me, it's not that uh, per se. The problem is not on us mm. because uh, you realize that each country have their own uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example with Kenya. There's something that we've done quite tremendously well. Uh, a trader who wants to import or export anything from Kenya. Uh, we have the government has, uh, uh, has, uh, has aligned all the th all the government agencies that are involved in the regulation of imports and exports into one single platform through the Kenya Trade Networks agencies. Whereby, for example, if it is you, you want to, let's say, export uh, uh, tea, for example, maybe to West Africa. Yeah. Uh, majority of the people do not know. You just go to the single window platform through the Kenya Trade. I will be in a position to check some of these requirements. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem that we face is that uh, while trading with the 
other countries within the uh, within Africa, I realize that uh, getting those uh, uh, approvals become quite a challenge. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if we were do, to export the same maybe to China or maybe Europe, uh, it would be very faster uh, as compared to that. So some why, some, why is it? Mm. Uh, the problem is uh, regulations. Uh, so each country they try to maybe they still they, uh, they, we are in still in the process okay. of aligning uh, each country's regulations. Is it? So yeah. let me ask a question. This is what I wanted to ask: Is there goodwill? Because the historical situation that I referred to happened because there was goodwill. Mm -hmm. The three presidents were willing; they were ready. In fact, they were talking about integrating politically. Yes, that was the discussion: how to rotate it. Then all manner of things happened. Is there goodwill right now? If you ask me whether there's goodwill, uh, I can say yes, there's goodwill. If you look at, uh, because uh, uh, the number of countries that have signed to this are currently over around 54 countries within Africa. If you look at the implementation stages, uh, implementation is not something which, ca uh, which happens uh, uh, immediately. But it's, neither it's, does it it's, take it's, forever. It's, neither does it for, take forever and that yes. is why you will see that uh if you look at the timeline uh, the timeline we are supposed to have achieved this by 2060 we are still in 2023 so we you know, <laughs> so you're saying we have time and <laughs> uh, well, 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 let, let me shed some light here yeah. first and foremost kenya has been one of the driving forces both president uru kenyatta and president william bruto have been pushing mm -hmm. a lot of the issues um around implementation if there's any country that has had goodwill it is uh kenya. it is kenya in fact the president william bruto by allowing um, uh, free access, visa-free access mm. to Kenya is part of that step. And Kenya is actually, has consistently been ahead of the curve. So in as far as East Africa is concerned, in as far as Kenya is concerned, yes, we have a lot of goodwill. Mm. Do we have problems on the continent? Yes, we do. Mm. Chief of which, by the way, is South Africa and its customs union that includes Namibia, uh, uh, Botswana, and things like that. It's it's not it's not personal. I'm just saying that the ones who are I'm shaking my head because I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yes, you know. So there, there they is, are restrictive. Yes, there are pockets. There are pockets that have been more willing. So I agree with the sentiment that yes, they've set up a deadline of 2060, but that deadline does not say that countries should not participate before that time. Mm. But the question but, is, why 2060? We're in 2023. I, you know. It's like someone is deliberately postponing this thing. All the people who need to make decisions are alive here. Well, are we dealing with some people who are dead? No. no. Plus yeah. the institutions then that yes. need the companies, the organizations, the yeah. 32 government agencies. government agencies that you speak of in Kenya alone, they are existing now. Mm -hmm. They are alive. Yeah. They are working. They are people who are driving them. So I think the overarching question here is, why is it not happening? And mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is that we have to go back here. If the interest, usually you'll see that a, a, a certain trajectory will be taken by the person who sits because of the character of the person who sits at the helm of operation. That if there is insistence on a certain thing, and I'm not just talking about governments, the people who sit on the heads of those agencies and insist that this thing actually must move. If we look at the example of ECOWAS, it, it took that there were two presidents who were sitting amongst the several nations that make up ECOWAS. There were two characters who said, you know what, man, we've been talking about this thing for 40 years. Get it done. And it's done. If we don't have to actually wait until 2060 to see some of these things happening, we can be talking about trade amongst Africans and African countries. Do we we don't already, have to depend on China. We are trading and we've been trading for the longest time even before we were nation states as we are. Okay? Mm. When I ask about goodwill, yes, I understand. Goodwill isn't just a willingness, but it's a willingness to ensure it works, but it's a willingness to understand why some people are resistant to what you are doing. Mm. Because it looks like we're being resistant. What is it that we Kenyans are projecting that our neighbors and friends don't like? It's a question I would ask. Mm. Because if indeed there is a union, if you hear, if you talk about the murmurs, there's a feeling that we will take advantage and our position will be of greater advantage to us than our neighbors. That has been an underlying fear. I think there's a proverb that I uh, like the city and uh, do you normally like proverbs. There's a Kenyan proverb that I always like also uh, 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 quoting yes. whereby we say that if you don't travel, you always think that your mom is the best cook. <laughs> if you come closer within uh, the <laughs> Africa, I'll give you an example with Congo Brazzaville. 
the meat consumption in Congo Brazzaville is very high, mm. whereby a kg of meat goes to up to 2,000 Kenya shillings. I realize that uh, Kenya, we export quite a lot of meat uh, to Saudi Arabia, to UAE mm. countries. Do we so but you realize that the, uh, yeah, some of the problems that we're having is uh, maybe uh, uh, several bottlenecks that a Kenyan trader can uh, maybe use um, can surmount to have their meat exported to Congo Brazzaville, for example. Uh, with uh, Africa continental free trade area, we realize that uh, there are quite a number of things. If you look at uh, uh, that uh, model, uh, the way it is, uh, there are some things which we need to do. For example, each African state in terms of building of the infrastructure. If you look, if you come to Kenya, like Mark has said, Kenya, we are always very quick. Uh, into implementing some of these uh, requirements of these treaties. Yes, we are. If you look at maybe the port of Mombasa, we have a very good port in Lamu, a transit port. We do. Th that is in a position of uh, supporting the northern corridor, uh, yes. Ethiopia, Djibouti, South Sudan, and the rest. So I think, uh, for example, one thing that we need to do, for example, for Lamu port to work, the government must get make it uh, uh, that we get uh, it, it, it right on security uh, along that uh, corridor all the way from Lamu, all the way to uh, Djibouti, Ethiopia, and uh, even South Sudan. Let me ask you a question. Mm. Yeah. Why is it that for the longest time, I'm speak anecdotally, mm. South African businessmen were, were more welcomed in Tanzania than Kenyans? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, SADC, it, Tanzania was part of SADC, mm. but you need to understand um, South Africa's economic philosophy. South Africa, the country, and then South Africa, the customs union, mm -hmm. is a bit of a bully. If you ask Namibians what they feel about Pretoria and their uh, custom hegemony over the area, mm -hmm. they're very unhappy. But Tanzania has always felt for South Africa as an easy target. Why? Because its industries are not as competitive. They do not have much industry and things like that. So South Africans always assumed that South African products would be more easily be consumed in Tanzania. I say this because there are many South African businesses that have tried to make headway in this country and, they can't. and, the, and the success isn't as great as somebody may want. Again, I'm asking the question, why? I think uh, if you ask me, uh, I might not have the right answer for that question, but you realize that uh, before we started this uh, uh, conversation uh, on, uh, on inter-Africa trade, uh, we had quite a lot of challenges, not only to the South African traders, even to the Kenyan traders in other countries. But you realize that uh, the mindset is now changing. Mm. People are, st are starting to embrace because if you look at uh, the one advantage that we are having as Africa, number one is the population. Uh, uh, continent with, with uh, around 1.3 billion uh, people. Uh, if you look at uh, maybe the GDP, for example, we intend to grow the, uh, the business by 2055 uh, to around uh, with over almost eight trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the city, you, know you, you, you might be laughing, but one thing that uh, in, re in response to the question that you asked, <laughs> mm. uh, I talked about the trade blocks, the eight in Africa. For example, there are some preferential treatment that as a member of ESC, I can get it in Tanzania, or you can get it in maybe Rwanda, then uh, you can get it in uh, South Africa, for example. So if we must now integrate some of these, we have one uh, common customs union uh, for Africa, and then we r remove some of these unnecessary uh, impediments but that impede trade. You know, I think for me, the thing that really does get my goat sometimes is the uh, why does it take so long? Surely, it must be clearly evident the benefits that come along with certain things. That when you have your security along borders sorted out, that means that you guarantee that trade routes then are safe and certain things can happen, whereby then you now allay the fears of anybody who says, well, you know, well, we as heads of state will not be able to come into a certain territory because we fear um, the issues of security. So the benefits far outweigh any kind of myopic agenda that you would have in not wanting to sort out your issues. Number two, you look at the numbers, 1.3 billion, $8 trillion in the possibility of trade in Africa. You don't even have to look outside. You yeah. don't have to trade with China. You don't have to trade with anybody else if you focus your energies on these 54 countries yeah, here. Very true. So what is it? And I, th I think that's the question we started with. And 
50 minutes later we're still <laughs> trying to ask ourselves what is it there must be something and are we all are we gonna chalk it up to just goodwill because I can see it here. I don't sit in a parastator. I don't sit in an agency. But I can see the benefits by sorting out a number of things that will guarantee that economies will rise and that people will be lifted from one level to the next if you just set certain things in place. Do you know, uh, City mentioned something that, that we've missed and missed. During the setting up of the African Union, all the way from Jomo Kenyatta to Kwame Nkrumah to Selassie to whoever, we had leaders who had Pan-African vision. Okay, They did not just consider themselves leaders of their countries, they considered themselves leaders of the continent. In Is fact, uh, look at how they supported <laughs> Zimbabwe <laughs> in its strives uh, for independence and things like that. At the end of the day, what Africa has lost in terms of the quality of its leadership is we've had leaders who've looked more inwards in terms of their countries, mm -hmm. become more protectionist and wanted to consolidate their power. What needs to happen is what uh, Uhuru Kenyatta did and what William Ruto has continued to do, which is to spur that pan-Africanist idea, idealism, First and foremost, because you will fix the tariffs, you will fix the non-tariff uh, uh, barriers. Mm. But if we don't fix the issue of goodwill, desire and political goodwill as well, to push this forward, we will be stuck. At twenty sixty, will seem too fast, too too soon. In fact, not too far. Do you see those ideas running through, um, Frederick, when we're talking about some of the things that you face on a daily basis, whether we're talking about government to government, whether we're talking about business to business happening across borders, uh, some of the things, I mean, it's ludicrous to think that, for example, countries just here um, across borders, maybe skip two or three, that have a need so great that can be delivered by neighboring bordering countries doesn't happen because of trade barriers. And we say we are all part of one agreement. Do you see that? Uh, 2060, <laughs> when that will come, we'll still be talking about the same kind of thing. Uh, I think uh, as an optimist, I think uh, I see uh, positivities towards achieving that because uh, uh, having attended uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, these conversations, having been part and parcel of this, uh, uh, some of these conversations within uh, 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 which, which I get to ensuring that uh, we boost into African trade. Uh, if you look, uh, for example, where we are currently, it's different from where we are uh, with uh, into Africa trade maybe three years ago. I give you an example. For example, Kenya, we've had uh, our first consignment uh, that was cleared from the port of Mombasa all the way uh, to Accra, Ghana, a courtesy of this uh, uh, intra African trade, the Africa continental free trade area. Uh, secondly, I believe uh, that uh, in as much as we want qu uh, these quick solutions, the things that uh, maybe each country, as uh, Mark and uh, City have said, mm. we need goodwill uh, from every country. Uh, all the governments, uh, they must give it. For, uh, because, for example, as a logistician, if uh, we have to maybe send a consignment uh, uh, from, uh, let's say, from uh, Namanga border mm. all the way to uh, Johannesburg by road, uh, you realize that uh, maybe a truck driver or, uh, will need like around uh, almost uh, 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 four lines that you must communicate because we have several networks. The number that will call you with uh, in, while uh, Tanzania is different all the way to, to that. So I think in, even in terms of uh, the network, uh, these are some of the issues that must be sorted. Uh, matters to do with the infrastructure. Mm. And uh, you realize that uh, each country is mandated on what they need to do. Uh, in terms of Kenyan situation, I think we are doing tremendously well. Mm. In terms of building our road network, the railway, all the way to the borders. Uh, these are things which have been planned. Some are in action. Matters to do with the ports, I think, as Kenya... Uh, from what we are supposed to do, we are doing quite tremendously well. I know City will uh, interject, uh, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> trying, to, trying, to, trying to do what other countries are doing. No, 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 Frederick. Yeah, I, what other I, countries I, are doing. I, I am with you, <laughs> and I like your optimism. Yes, so I'm... Um, Sometimes that is exactly what we need. Yeah, mm. I'm personally optimistic because uh, we have quite a lot of potential on what we can do. Mm. And that's why we, as uh, from KIFO, the Kenya International Freight and Warehousing Association, we welcome 
all the experts in the logistics sector, the opinion leaders, government, uh, all the stakeholders, uh, innovators to this conference. This is a discussion that we cannot afford uh, maybe to leave it here. Mm -hmm. This is a conversation that we must take it from here, uh, discuss, uh, address some of these challenges uh, because uh, the theme of even the conference is uh, 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 continent to continent. Mm. Uh, we want to do with all these challenges that uh, affect the global supply chain. Mm. I just have do a quick question. Yeah. You have it, when the person mm -hmm. who comes, mm -hmm. will they find customers or just information? Yeah, for your information, by the way, I didn't tell you this. Uh, if you look at the, in logistics, mm -hmm. we believe in what we call the seven R's. Mm. Uh, logistician must ensure they do seven R's. Mm. Number one, uh, give your customer the right product mm -hmm. uh, in right quantity, uh, in right condition, at the right place, in right time, the right customer, the right price. And one of the things that we are doing, you realize uh, we need, uh, for example, logistics is all about networking. Right. Uh, for example, Mark, I can assure you, maybe you might be intending to do to be an export of a, uh, of a particular product. These conferences like this, this is where we get most of our customers. Mm. And most of us, we are good ambassadors of the country. So when we also go outside there, we market Kenya, we tell them uh, the potential that we are having, uh, the business that have been untapped. So that one I can answer in affirmative. That they'll be there. Yeah. One can only hope for the best and that as folks come together to discuss these issues and these matters that will actually make some headway and that we'll see a shift in some of these things. Frederick Alo is the National Secretary of the Kenya International Freight and Warehousing Association has been our guest this hour. Thank you for joining in the conversation. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day.